So please do open up your Bibles at John chapter 9. You, you are going to need those, so do have those open, and let's pray and ask that the Lord would speak this this morning through this part of the Bible. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning that just now you would open up the eyes of our hearts and the eyes of our minds so that we would see clearly the truth that lies before us in your word. Oh Lord, speak to us this morning and show us Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Dave asked me if I would give him a lift home, so of course I said yes because Dave didn't drive. And as I turned the corner onto Dave's street, the view was incredible. Dave lives in Bangor West. He lives in an apartment and he has a clear view over Belfast Lock. And the first night that I dropped him home, it was sunset. The clouds had been painted with pinks and with lilacs. The rays of the sun were, were coming through the clouds and they were reflecting up off the water. The heavens were declaring the glory of God. And just out of sheer amazement at the view, I said to him, Dave, this is an incredible view you've got here. To which Dave replied with sarcasm, I wouldn't know, I've never seen it. Taken away by the view, I'd forgotten that the reason Dave didn't drive was because Dave was blind. Dave had never seen this light show that happened outside his front door every night. Dave had never as a kid been excited to see a rainbow in the sky. Dave had never seen the 50 shades of green that we have on this island. Dave had never seen his mother's face. Dave had never even seen his own face in the mirror. And as we come to John chapter 9, we, we meet a man like my friend Dave. We meet a man who'd been born blind. And when you look at verse 1, it tells you there that Jesus saw him. Jesus was walking past and he, he saw the man who was a beggar. Many of us, when we see beggars, we look straight ahead, don't we? We don't let our eyes see them. But Jesus saw him. And as Jesus fixed his gaze on this man who'd been born blind, his disciples had a theological question for him. One of those difficult questions, one of those why questions, they wanted to know why this man had been born blind. And so they give Jesus two options. If you have a look at the passage, look at verse 2 with me. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? At this point of time, there was two main views as to why this man would have been born blind. One of them was that God was punishing him for his sin in the womb. There was this belief that children might be able to sin in the womb. And so the disciples said to him, Jesus, was he born blind because he, he sinned when he was in the womb? Or the other belief was that a child who was born blind, maybe he was being punished for the sin of their parents, probably based on a twisted understanding of Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. Was he born blind because of sin in the womb? Was God punishing him for the sin of his parents? Why was this man born blind? We all have those why questions, don't we? All of us here this morning have those why questions. There are times in our own life when we seem to go through an incredible amount of suffering. Very often it feels like we're suffering from wave after wave after wave of hardship. Do we not question in those moments, why God? Why are you letting this happen to me? Do we not sometimes wonder, God, what have I done to deserve this? What sin have I committed? Why are you letting this happen to me? Well, this morning, if you're a Christian, I would like to categorically say that, that God is not punishing you because of your sin. No, this morning, if you're here and you're a Christian, all of your sin was put on Jesus. Jesus took the punishment for all of your sin. God is not directly punishing you for your sin. Instead, the reason why you face suffering is because of the sin of someone else. I imagine Jesus could have turned to his disciples and said, actually, it's, it's not his sin, it was the sin of Adam. You see, because of Adam's sin, that's why we face suffering. 
Because of Adam's sin, that's why there's death. That's why there's sickness. That's why there's pain. That's why everybody in this world goes through the difficulties that they go through. Our world is one that has been broken and marred by Adam's sin. And now we all live as part of that. But anyway, back to our text. The disciples give Jesus the options. Hey, Jesus, whose sin was it? Was it his sin? Or or was it his parents' sin? But Jesus says to them, it was neither. And Jesus doesn't answer the question. He doesn't tell them what caused the man's sin. Instead, Jesus moves to a completely different thing. And he tells them the purpose of this man's suffering. And we see that in verse 3. Jesus says there, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened, why? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. Hey guys, this man wasn't born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. He was born blind because God is going to do something incredible in his life. God is going to do something spectacular in this man's life. The works of God are going to be seen in him. And then Jesus makes a statement about himself. Have a look at verse 5. He then says to them, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, if you read through the Bible from the start to the end, you will see that the word light has layers and layers and layers of meaning. It means so many different things. But you see here right now, whenever Jesus says that he's the light of the world, there is one thing I am confident that he's saying. And the one thing I'm confident he's saying is that he is God's presence right here, right now on earth. He's saying to his disciples, I want you to see who I am. I am God's presence. I am the light of God right here, right now on earth. And if you're wondering why I think that, it's because of what happens just before John chapter 9. In John chapter 7 and chapters 8, it's holiday time. It's holiday time in Jerusalem. And the people there, they're celebrating something called the Festival of Tabernacles. And at the Festival of Tabernacles, there's something really special happens. And let me just read you a description of what happens. During the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a great ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple, which involved the lighting of four golden oil-filled lamps in the court of women. These lamps were huge candelabras. They were 70 five feet high. They were lit in the temple at night to remind the people of what? Of God's presence in the pillar of fire that guided Israel in their wilderness journey. So Jesus has just been at the festival of tabernacles. They've just lit up these huge lights and the lights remind the people of God's presence with them in the fire that guided them by night. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says this. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So in John chapter 8, in the temple, he's claimed to be God in the flesh. He's claimed to be the presence of God in the world. And here in John chapter 9, he's going to do it. He's going to show and display that he really is God. A bit like what I was saying with the kids. He's now about to show that he really is the God man. And how's he going to do it? He's going to make this blind man see. I want you to imagine, just for a moment, that you're the blind man. I want you just for a moment to to try to put yourself in his shoes. So there you are, you're sitting and you're begging. And then you hear some people talking, and and the question they're asking is, it's pretty uncomfortable, and it's pretty hurtful. They say to the rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? And then you're waiting to hear which of the two answers the rabbi gives, but this rabbi gives a different answer. He says something you've never heard before. He says, neither this man or his parents sinned. And then you hear the rabbi say that he's the the light of the world. And you know what that means? This rabbi is claiming to be from God. And then the next thing you hear is really weird. 
Spitting. You hear spitting somewhere really close to you. And then the next thing, you feel something gross being smeared over your eyes. And then you hear the words of the rabbi. And the rabbi says to you, go, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So you do it. You believe that something spectacular might actually be about to take place in your life. And so you get up and and you fumble your way to the pool and you get into the water and you put your face down and you, and you, start, to, you start to wash it off and the mud's coming off. And eventually, you pluck up the courage to open your eyes. And you can see. You can see buildings and you can see people and you can see trees and you can see your hands and you can even see your face in the water. It's, it's like nothing you could have imagined. You can imagine the yell, can you? I can see, I can see, I can see. Can you imagine the excitement of this man? You can imagine he didn't walk home that day. You can imagine he ran because he could run for the first time without tripping on things. You can imagine him singing to himself, can't you? Singing from Psalm 146 the whole way home. The Lord opens the blind eyes of the blind. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. And he opened my eyes to see. You can imagine him, can't you, bursting through his front door. Hey, mom, dad, look, no cane. Can you imagine the the joy on his parents' faces? Can you imagine their tears as they see their son able to see? Can you see how amazing this is? Can you see how incredible it is what Jesus did for this man? He opened his eyes and this man's life was never, ever going to be the same again. But that day, the blind man didn't just receive physical sight. He also received spiritual sight. He had his eyes opened to see who Jesus really was. And again, we we, we sang earlier in the service the, the song written by John Newton, Amazing Grace. John Newton, in his later years, was blind. He'd been an atheist. He came to Christ. He became blind. But what did he write in his song? He said, I once was blind, but now I see. John Newton saw Jesus. And here in our passage, the blind man gets clear vision of who Jesus is. The first thing he says about Jesus in verse 11 is just that he's a man. If you have a look there, when his neighbors ask him how he'd been healed, he says, the man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. So he he just recognizes Jesus at this stage as a man. And then after being taken to the Pharisees and interrogated by them, and they turned and they said, hey, listen, who do you say Jesus is? Well, Well, his understanding of Jesus, it's become clearer. Look what he says to them in verse 17. He is a prophet. And then he's brought in by the Pharisees later on, like we read, and he's interrogated again, and he's getting really fed up at this stage. He's getting fed up with the Pharisees' questions. He's getting fed up with the Pharisees' blindness. And eventually he says to them that Jesus is a man from God. Look at verse 31. He says about Jesus, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind man before. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Hey, Pharisees, I now believe that Jesus is a man from God. But then finally, at the end of our passage, he sees with the clearest of vision who Jesus is, the Son of Man and his Lord. Let's pick up what happened there in verse 35. Look with me at the text. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. If you look at how Jesus describes himself, 
the most common title he uses for himself is the title he uses here, the title, the Son of Man. Now, very often, whenever we hear that title being used by Jesus, we think he's talking about his humanity. We think he's claiming there that he's, he's fully human, but in fact, it's the other way around. Jesus, whenever he uses the title Son of Man, he's actually claiming his divinity. He's claiming his divinity. And how do we work that out? Well, it's because of what happens in Daniel chapter 7. If you read in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has this amazing heavenly vision. And he sees one like a son of man riding on the clouds of heaven. And he comes before the Ancient of Days. And the Ancient of Days gives this son of man divine power over creation and over judgment. And everyone worships him. This son of man in in Daniel chapter 7 is a heavenly man. He's a heavenly figure. He is a divine being. And so here Jesus says to this blind man, do you believe in the son of man? Do you believe that I am the one who will judge the world? Do you believe that I have been given authority over all creation? Do you believe I am who I've been trying to show everyone that I am? And the man says, I believe. Isn't it beautiful? The man who was physically blind has now received spiritual sight. But there's others in the passage and they don't see Jesus. There are others in our passage and they remain blind. They stay blind. The blind man's story should give us hope for our friends and our family who who haven't seen Jesus yet. Jesus can open the spiritual eyes of any blind person. It's wonderful. But there are people in this passage who remain blind. Um, I don't know if you've seen it in some of the sports, but I think it's genius and also quite funny. But some of the referees are sponsored by spec savers. Have you seen that? And it's brilliant, isn't it? Because because referees, I mean, you just kind of think, how do they not see that? Um, I go to watch Linfield and sometimes the shout comes from the terraces, are you blind, referee? And I hear down at Seaview, they have a better saying, are your eyes painted on, referee? It's funny, isn't it? The referees should see. They're the ones who should see. And yet sometimes it's almost like they don't want to. The handball in the box, the foul, they're the ones who should see. And yet they don't. And this morning, there's not three blind mice in this passage, but there's three blind groups of people. And this morning, I want to suggest three things that blind them. And I want to suggest this morning that if you're not a Christian, if you've not yet seen Jesus, that these three things may be blinding you. So the first group of people are the man's neighbors. And they are blinded by their skepticism. The man's just got a sight. He's ran home. He's, he's seen his parents. And now everyone in the neighborhood is talking about this. Everyone has seen what's happened to this man. And then look at what happens in verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Look what some claimed. Some claim that he was. So some may say, Yes, it's him. Of course it's him. It's definitely him. But look what others said. No, he only looks like him. It's not him. He just looks like him. They doubt. They don't believe what their eyes are telling them. They don't believe what's staring them in the face. They're skeptical. No, it can't possibly be him. He just looks like him. They are skeptical. They're blinded by their skepticism. Skepticism, what is that? It's, it's, it's basically having an attitude that doubts. To be a skeptic is to doubt things. It's to question things. Now, let me, don't mishear me. There's a healthy amount of skepticism we all have to have. I mean, whenever you get that phone call and they say, hello, we're, we're calling from your bank and we need your bank details, we've lost them. You know, skepticism seems us from being scammed. We doubt that, we question that, we're not taken in by that. 
Skepticism also helps us to, to really grow in our faith. We ask questions of the Bible. We ask questions of, of what we believe and we find the answers and we grow in our faith. Skepticism can be good. But there can also be a very unhealthy type of skepticism. And that is when skepticism just overtakes us. When being skeptical is our predominant attitude to everything in life. You see, whenever we embrace skepticism to the point where it overtakes us, we doubt everything and we don't believe that anything is true. Someone with unhealthy skepticism doubts that their husband loves them, even though he's been married to her for 40 years. Someone with unhealthy skepticism doesn't believe anything that they see on the news. They don't believe a word that the government say. They don't believe anything that their doctor tells them. To have unhealthy skepticism, to be filled with skepticism, to have an attitude which is predominantly skepticism makes us blind to the truth. And when it comes to trusting in Jesus, and when it comes to seeing Jesus, very often we can pile up doubt and doubt and doubt and doubt and doubt on top of one another that they become like a brick wall. A brick wall that stops us from seeing the truth. A brick wall that stops us seeing Jesus. It's good to ask questions, but not if we never look for answers. It's good to ask questions about our faith, but not if we don't go and find the reasons. There's a man in my church who'd been coming to church for 40 years. He was dragged along by his wife, mainly. Uh, kept her happy, happy wife, happy life. And so this man came every Sunday and, and he sat in the pews every Sunday and he sat there for 40 years. And we ran Christianity Explored and his wife wanted to go, so guess where he was going? Yeah, Christianity Explored. So he came along to Christianity Explored. And what had transpired was that this man had six big questions that he had sat on for all these years. And these six questions had stopped him from coming to faith in Christ. And it had never crossed his mind to even go and try and find the answers. He thought there were no answers to these questions. And of course, part of Christianity Explored is you can ask whatever questions you want. And so we worked through them. Some were very, very difficult and some were very, very easy. And at the end of the course, he put his trust in Christ. He came to faith in Christ and his life has never been the same again. Folks, if you're sitting here this morning and you've just got these questions and these questions are, are stopping you from coming to Christ, I just want to encourage you to go and look for answers. The answers are out there. Speak to Stephen, get a book. Don't just sit on them though and be blind. Now to be fair to the blind man's neighbours, they do, they go and they try to get the answer. So who do they take the blind man to? Who do they go to with all their questions? Well, they go to the next group of blind people. They go to the Pharisees, the religious people, for their answers. Um, I'm sure you don't know people like this, um, but there are people who manage to find a problem in every situation. There are people, and it doesn't matter what restaurant they go to, there's a problem with their meal. There are people, and it doesn't matter who they get their hair cut by, something's not right. I was in a coffee shop a couple of weeks ago, and a lady came to the trained baristas and said, this isn't made properly, it was a flat white. And then she told them how a flat white should taste and how that didn't taste like and how it should be made and how they didn't make it like that. There was a problem. There are some people, and they always find a problem in something. Well, the Pharisees are like that with Jesus. They always find a problem with him. They always find a reason not to believe in him. They always find a reason to oppose him. And here the problem is how Jesus healed the blind man. Jesus has just healed this blind man in their city. The blind man comes to them and they hear all about this story and do they run to Jesus and say, Jesus, we're so sorry for how we've treated you. Jesus, we're so sorry we rejected you. Jesus, we're so sorry we plotted to kill you. No, they don't. They say, Jesus, we've got a problem here. 
And what's the problem? The problem is how Jesus did the miracle. You see, Jesus, he made mud, didn't he? He spat on the ground and then he picked up the mud and he, he put the saliva and the mud together and he made the, the paste for the man's eye. Well, you see, doing that, do you know what that was called by the Pharisees? That was called kneading, you know, like kneading bread. And that was against their rules. Jesus was a sinner because to make the paste, he broke their rules. Isn't that unbelievable? Isn't that almost crazy? The Pharisees judged Jesus to be a sinner. They refuse to see who he is. They, they say he's not a man from God. And you see what's blinding them? It's their self-righteousness. They were better than Jesus. They knew better than Jesus. They were so, so self-righteous. They would have sung Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and salvation. They heard Jesus say he's the light of the world. They saw Jesus demonstrate he's the light of the world. But they say to Jesus, we don't need your salvation. We are good enough in and of ourselves. I wonder, is that you this morning? I wonder, is that you as you sit here? Maybe you come to church every single week. Maybe you keep the rules that you think are important to keep. Maybe you have your own moral standards. Maybe you think of yourself as a really good person. And you think of yourself so highly that you don't see a need for Jesus. You don't see a need for forgiveness. You don't see a need to bow before him and call him Lord. Maybe you're blinded by your self-righteousness. I have buried people like that. I've buried people who've gone to church for years and have been disgusted by the moral decay of society, have been disgusted by the moral decay in the church and have seen themselves of good people and have never come to Christ. Folks, if that's you this morning, please, would you ask the Lord to show you your need of Christ? There is only one sinless person in this world and it's not us. It's the one who died for our sin. Then the last group of people who, I don't know if they were blind, but they certainly claimed to be, they certainly pretended to be blind, were the man's parents. The parents are brought in before the Pharisees. The Pharisees have three questions. Is this your son? Was he blind? How did he get healed? Yes, he's our son, they said. Yes, he was born blind, they said. But what did they say about Jesus? They said, who opened his eyes and how he sees, we don't know. They did know, didn't they? They'd heard the story. They'd seen Jesus at work in the life of their son, and yet they said they don't know. We're blind. We don't know. We don't know who did this. And then in verse 22, we see what makes them say they're blind. It's fear. Look at verse 22 with me. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. They had seen who Jesus was, but out of fear, they didn't give him credit. Out of fear, they wouldn't identify with him. Again, I wonder if that's you this morning. I wonder, are there some of you here this morning and you have seen the Lord Jesus at work in the lives of your friends? You've seen Jesus at work in the life of your family? You've even experienced something of the work of Jesus in your own life. But you're afraid to admit it and you're afraid to acknowledge it and you're afraid to follow Jesus for fear of what other people will think. You're worried what the mums at the school gate will say. You're worried what your mates down the pub will think. You're worried how your friends in school will treat you. I wonder, are there some of you here this morning and you have seen and you know and you know you need to come to Christ and you know you need to trust him but you're acting blind? If that's you this morning, then I want to suggest that there's something that you should fear more than what your friends think. Something you should fear more than what your friends say. And the thing that you should fear more is what Jesus is going to say when he comes back to judge the world. Look with me at verse 39. 
Jesus, talking to the man who can now see, says this, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Now please, please, please look very, very closely at verse 41. Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Folks, if you're here and you've seen Jesus, and you know he's calling you to follow him, and you know he's calling you to trust him, and you know what he's done, and you believe it, but you're pretending you're blind, Jesus says that your guilt remains. Oh, this morning, would you trust him? Would you turn to him in obedience? Would you worship him? Would you bow the knee? Would you, would you trust him this morning? And the wonderful thing is that when you do, your guilt will be taken away, forgiveness will be yours, and your life will never be the same again. We've covered so much this morning. Let me just summarize. This morning, if you've seen Jesus, okay, if you're here and you're a Christian, you've seen him, thank the Lord that he's opened your eyes. This morning, if you have friends and your family who seem so spiritually blind, pray and ask the Lord to open their eyes because he can. This morning, if you're letting skepticism get in the way, go and find the answers to your questions. This morning, if you're letting self-righteousness get in the way, ask the Lord to show you what you're really like. And this morning, if you've seen Jesus, but are too afraid of what other people think, ask the Lord to make you more afraid of what Jesus will think when he comes to judge the world. Folks, my hope for each of you here this morning, for every single one of you, is that one day you will be able to sing with honesty and integrity these words, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you have opened many of our eyes here this morning, that we have seen your beauty and your power and your salvation. But Father, we pray this morning for those whose eyes are still shut, for those whose eyes are still closed, especially for those who we know and love, and Father, our prayer this morning is that Christ would open those eyes, that those we love would see him and have their lives changed forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.